Well, most of us made it through the 2017 Ramadan Bombathon, so we can finally get back to ordinary levels of Islamic terrorism. The final results have been posted at thereligionofpeace.com, and once again, Islam absolutely shattered the competition. Allahu Akbar shouting followers of Muhammad racked up 1,595 confirmed kills in 174 terrorist attacks. All other religions combined failed to launch a single attack in the name of their respective ideologies, showing the world why Islam is the undisputed champion of religious-based violence. There were two apparently anti-Muslim attacks in which two Muslims died, one close to a mosque in Great Britain and another outside a mosque in India. For those of you who are going to object, saying that the man who died in London was already dying or that the attacker was drunk and had mental problems, we're trying to be as generous as possible here. Even when we're as generous as possible with the numbers, the number of Muslims killed by Islamophobes during Ramadan can be counted on two fingers. If you want to count the number of Muslims killed by their fellow Muslims during Ramadan, you'd better be some sort of mutant with a lot of extra hands. Here are five takeaways from Ramadan 2017. First, we have scientific confirmation of the link between Islam and terrorism. The basic steps of the scientific method are gather data, formulate a hypothesis, make some predictions based on the hypothesis, and then see if the predictions are confirmed. In this case, we had plenty of prior data about terrorist attacks carried out in the name of Allah and the Muslim sources that call for such attacks, so we formulated a hypothesis. Islam promotes terrorism. Based on this hypothesis, we predicted that the month of Ramadan, when Muslims try to focus more intently on their religion, would be an absolute bloodbath. Ramadan turned out to be an absolute bloodbath, which means that anyone who denies the connection between Islam and terrorism is an enemy of the scientific method. Second, Islamic holidays are not like other holidays. Western politicians and reporters keep making the same mistake over and over again. They assume that since non-Islamic religious holidays are peaceful events where Jews or Christians or Hindus express their gratitude, Islamic holidays must be the same. But if a religion calls for the violent subjugation of the entire world and promotes terrorism as the means of achieving this goal, at least some adherents of the religion are going to express their gratitude by slaughtering unbelievers and hypocrites. We see this every year during Ramadan. But that won't stop our leaders and the media from assuring us at the beginning of Ramadan 2018 that Ramadan is a month of peace. Third, Islamic supremacism is rampant, even among moderate Muslims. Following the London mosque attack, many Muslims were quick to describe the fear they felt. As a Muslim, this is like the place where I come to do my prayer. Me and my kids and everything, we have to feel safe. And if I don't feel safe in, 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 in the mosque, so I can't feel safe anywhere else. If they send to us the animal, the United Kingdom is not safe, we have to know, then we're going to move back to our country to die. Our country is better. Think about this. One man who was drunk and had mental health problems but was angry at Muslims drove a van into a crowd of Muslims, and so Muslims are completely justified in feeling afraid for themselves and their children and their community. Because of one attack, they can no longer feel safe in Great Britain. And yet, after every Islamic terrorist attack, these same Muslims tell us that it's irrational and delusional to fear the ideology that led to the attacks. If you say, as a non-Muslim, I can't feel safe walking across a bridge. I can't feel safe sending my daughter to an Ariana Grande concert because there are people who want to slaughter us in the name of Allah. The same Muslims who tell us that they can't feel safe in Great Britain because of all the Islamophobia will condemn you for fearing an ideology that has produced far more attacks than Islamophobia can ever hope to produce. Why the double standards? Well, in Islam, Muslim lives matter more than other lives. According to the Quran, unbelievers are lower than cattle. 
In Surah 98, verse 6, Allah declares, Verily, those who disbelieve in the religion of Islam, the Quran, and Prophet Muhammad, from among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, and al-Mushrikun, Mushrikun are idolaters, will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of creatures. We're the worst of creatures. What about Muslims? In Surah 3, verse 110, Allah says to Muslims, You are the best of peoples ever raised up for mankind. Because unbelievers are utterly inferior to Muslims, it makes no sense for unbelievers to complain about how we're treated. When we're killed, we need to accept it. It's not like we deserve better. But since Muslims are superior to unbelievers, they, of course, can speak out when they're being mistreated. If you haven't noticed how disturbingly prevalent Islamic supremacism is, even among moderate Muslims, just watch how moderate Muslims react to an Islamic terrorist attack and compare this with their reaction to an anti-Muslim attack. Fourth, politicians and reporters continue to view Muslims as subhuman animals. If you ask your average Western journalist, what have we learned from Ramadan 2017, the journalist will reply, we've learned how racist and Islamophobic Westerners are. Just look at the London mosque attack. Now, if you examine the numbers here and you think that Islamophobia is the most glaring problem, you're obviously extremely biased. You're treating Muslims and non-Muslims very differently. So why do journalists and politicians and actors and educators treat Muslims differently? They treat Muslims differently because most journalists and politicians and actors and educators in the West are undercover white supremacists. There, I said it. You see, there are two kinds of white supremacism, conscious and unconscious. Conscious white supremacism expresses itself in claims that white Westerners are superior to other groups. Unconscious white supremacism expresses itself in treating non-white, non-Westerners as if they're somehow less responsible for their actions or less capable of open discussion of their views. Watch how journalists and politicians and actors and educators respond after some tragedy. If Muslims slaughter men, women, and children, or gang rape a young girl, these journalists and politicians and actors and educators will try to silence critics, shut down the discussion, avoid any examination of what led to the tragedy. Why? Because deep down they're convinced that Muslims are like puppies that pee on the carpet. They just don't know any better, so don't criticize them. But if a white Westerner attacks a Muslim, suddenly these same journalists and politicians and actors and educators are ready to blast the ideology of the attacker. They want to dig inside his mind to see what he was thinking. They're ready to condemn anyone who's critical of Islam, even completely peaceful critics. They demand a public outcry. Why? Because white Westerners should know better. Ironically, then, the journalists and politicians and actors and educators who are most vocal in their defense of Islam are some of the most revolting anti-Muslim bigots the world has ever seen. Fifth, we are finally in a position to understand the baffling alliance between Islam and the left. If you consider the stated views of leftists, they're often diametrically opposed to what we find in the Quran. And yet leftists are ready to lay down their lives in their defense of the Quran. Strangest bedfellows ever. Why the alliance? Well, two different groups with very different ideologies can come to the exact same conclusion for completely different reasons. According to Islam, non-Muslims are the worst of creatures and therefore deserve whatever abuse they receive. Hence, non-Muslims need to keep their mouths shut when they're abused by Muslims. According to the left, Muslims are subhuman and therefore shouldn't be held responsible for their actions. Hence, non-Muslims need to keep their mouths shut when they're abused by Muslims. So the message 
of both groups is when unbelievers are slaughtered or raped in the name of Allah, shut up. And to both groups, I respectfully reply, make me. You have until next year's Ramadan Bamathon, when, I predict, we'll be having this exact same conversation all over again.